Did you know that walruses' conservancy status is classified as vulnerable? When most people think of animals at risk, they think of polar bears, mountain gorillas, black rhinos, but walruses are also facing serious threats. Today we're going to explore the vulnerability of a walrus species, examining the factors that put them at risk and why their survival matters. Understanding these challenges is crucial if we want to ensure the long-term survival of these incredible, and let's be honest, a bit funny-looking creatures. I mean, that mustache is really wonderful, but a bit more on that later. First, let's explore some basic facts about the walrus. There are essentially three types of walrus, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Laptev. The Laptev has a small population of between 5 and 10,000 individuals and live north of Siberia, so we'll be concentrating mostly on the Atlantic and Pacific, which are the two main subspecies. The Pacific walrus makes up about 90% of the worldwide walrus population, with estimates of about 250,000 individuals, including about 60,000 reproductively active females. The Pacific walrus occupies the continental shelf regions of the northern Bering and Chukchi Sea, spanning between Alaska and Russia. The range extends into the East Siberian Sea and, when sea ice is at its fullest, south towards the northern Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia and Bristol Bay in southwest Alaska. Both species rely heavily on pack ice for breeding, calving, and resting. During summer months, they head north. A single walrus can consume 80 to 110 pounds of food per day, eating more than 50 clams during a single 7-minute dive, which might account for its average weight of 1.8 tons. Their foraging activities disturb large quantities of sediment, encouraging mixing and movement of many organisms and increasing the patchiness of the benthos. The benthos refers to the community of organisms that live on, in, or immediately above the bottom of aquatic environments. This ecological engineering makes walruses integral to the structure and function of Arctic marine ecosystems and makes it a keystone species because it has a disproportionately large impact on For example, the Arctic ice cap has lost about 75% of its thickness since the 1980s. This change in the ice condition affects walruses' feeding habits, which are mainly shallow water clams and other marine animals. As the ice melts, these habitats are being destroyed, making it harder for walruses to survive. Their social beaching could decline by up to 50% by 2050 if current trends continue. The decline of sea ice is also affecting walrus breeding patterns. Female walruses rely on the ice to give birth and nurse their young, and with less ice available, again, they're being forced to find new habitats. This can lead to increased energy expenditure and reduced reproduction rates. A female will usually give birth every two to three years, which is among the lowest rate of pinnipeds. Pinnipeds are fin-footed semi-aquatic marine mammals. There's hope, however, and some inspiring conservation efforts are underway. For example, the U.S. Marine Mammal Protection Act in the United States has helped reduce hunting pressures on walruses. However, currently in 2025, the commission that oversees this act is in the process of being defunded entirely, and major changes to the Act have been proposed which activists say will gut it and make the Act all but useless. However, other organizations are keeping up the fight, like the World Wildlife Fund, which is working to protect walrus habitats and reduce the impact of climate change. These efforts show that with collective action, we can make a positive impact on walrus populations. Other government agencies that are helping are Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which is the primary Canadian federal agency charged with protecting the Atlantic walrus in Canadian waters. Through the Species at Risk Act, they develop and implement recovery strategies, assess threats, 
and coordinate conservation planning in collaboration with provincial governments and indigenous communities. And the North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission, which is an international body that brings together Arctic nations, including Norway, Iceland, Greenland, and the Faroe Islands, to coordinate research, management, and protection of marine mammals, including walruses in the North Atlantic region. Conservation initiatives like these are crucial, but they require continued support and funding by governments. By working together, we can protect walrus habitats and reduce the threats they face. This includes reducing our carbon footprint to slow down climate change and supporting organizations that work to protect marine wildlife. By understanding these challenges and supporting conservation efforts, we can help ensure the long-term survival of these incredible creatures. And concerning that mustache, it's really called the Vibrise. These stiff, bristly whiskers serve as a vital purpose. They are extremely sensitive and help walruses locate food on the dark, murky seafloor. The Vibrise can detect the smallest shellfish and other prey hidden in the sand making them essential tools for foraging and surviving in cold Arctic waters because underwater, walruses have very poor eyesight. So what do you think about walrus conservation? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you're interested in learning more about marine wildlife protection, please check out the resources in this video's description. We'll also find links to the resources we use for our research. And as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.